Okay, my name is Dr. Alan Coslett. I'm the lead admissions officer in the department, and I'm here today to talk to you, tell you uh, about our, our M Farm course, uh, the the course that leads to pharmacy as a profession. So a little bit of background. So I'm a pharmacist myself. Uh, many many years ago, I was trying to think about what I wanted to do. I loved the idea of science, and I loved the idea of of helping people. And I came across pharmacy as a, an opportunity to to help. Uh, people and to go forward and I'm still doing that today so today I'm going to try and convince you that pharmacy is a really interesting career opportunity with lots of opportunities in different roles uh, the roles that are available to you will probably be much greater than those that are available to, to me but I'll also talk about how we get there and what type of pharmacists we're looking for so in this talk I'm going to talk to you about the process of registration i.e becoming a pharmacist something about the career opportunities and indeed about the new opportunities that pharmacists have something about our school of pharmacy uh, and how we teach the M Farm course the content uh, the activities that we undertake some of the things that you may not come across and then about the enrollment process or the, the registration process in terms of joining uh, the course so what we're looking for for individual students and how we process them through the admissions until you become uh, a Cardiff student so hopefully I will cover everything in the background I have one of my colleagues Lisa Wynne Davis who's the admissions uh, team officer so you'll be in the background taking some of your questions if you have a question please put them into the Q&A and at the end of today we'll be going through some of those questions uh, and try and answer them as best we can if I haven't covered it in the talk itself so some information well pharmacy is a professional qualification the general pharmaceutical council is the overarching controlling body uh, they set the syllabus uh, at undergraduate level, they also then control the process of registration and obviously keep an eye on pharmacists as they're practicing uh, and obviously aware of what's going on. In the background then, there is also the Royal Pharmaceutical Society. This is obviously to think of as the educational arm supporting pharmacists and in fact supporting students and both of these uh, two have really good websites. A lot of detail them certainly around the general pharmaceutical council about individual schools of, of pharmacy about the course about where pharmacy is going in the future so you may want to go and have a look at these to have a, an understanding of what you're looking for from a course as i say becoming a professional person that has a number of steps for us in Cardiff, we're involved in that first step, and that is the M Farm degree. As I indicated, the General Pharmaceutical Council set a syllabus. It's then down to individual schools how they conduct that syllabus, i.e., how they teach it. Uh, but obviously, the overall content is going to be the same. So we're going to have a look at some of how we do that later on. But the idea is that knowledge base uh, will set the scene in terms of you understanding everything a pharmacist needs to do and direct you into the career opportunities that you're going to face. So pharmacists are scientists helping others. So what knowledge do we need? What skills do we need? The next step of that after the degree and you actually apply it as you're going from year three to year four is then what we call the pre-registration training year. Uh, please note on the General Pharmaceutical Council, you may also see this now being referred to as the foundation training year. Uh, there's subtle changes taking place at the moment and that foundation training is, is going to be the future. And the idea of that training year, you're in paid employment out in practice. With a tutor, you will be guiding you, checking that you are can practice safely as a pharmacist. And at the end of that training year, you'll then sit in exam with a professional body that allows you to then register as a practicing pharmacist. With the changes coming into the foundation training year, the idea is also at the end of that the year, the ability to become a prescribing pharmacist will also arise. So at the moment, every school of pharmacy in the United Kingdom is changing their M Pharm degree for new entrants, so the current first year students and anyone in the future, to make sure that we give you the skill set to not only become a pharmacist, but actually a prescribing uh, pharmacist in the future. Whilst we're doing all this, we're going to guide you regarding career development. So I've actually worked in community hospital. I wanted to be an industrial pharmacist, didn't get there, but actually my research is sponsored by one. And I work every day in the academic environment, but working very closely with, with Cardiff and Vale Trust in particular uh, on the clinical side of things. So your career can go down lots of different routes and we will guide and help you in terms of choosing that career path what is right for you will be different to a different student. So it's finding the niche that is right for you. We're also going to make sure that you have the skill set. 
and part of that is what we call professional development. So CPD is compulsory professional development. I have to do it for the professional body to make sure I stay up to date in the area of my expertise, the area that I work, to make sure I'm safe for working with patients. So what we do with our undergraduates, we get them to think of their own professional development. Part of that will be about career ideas, where do they want to go, but also about the skill set that they need, confidence in talking with people, communication skills, IT skills, a whole range of these. So we work with our students, not just about educational activities, but also skill development activities. And the ultimate, really, what we're looking for is for you to become a professional person. So professionalism, what that entails thinking about your skill set, what you're good at, what you're bad at, what that means in terms of criminality, where you work with people, things you do outside in real life, that could impact on your, your, your actual profession in terms of if you're not safe working with patients or patients perceive you to be not safe. So we talk to our students and guide them through that, that role of professionalism. And linked to that then is what we call fitness to practice. So anything that prevents me from working safely has to be declared to the professional body. And similarly with our students, if they do things, or if I was to do things as a, a professional, that knee may need to be reported and it has implications for my, my career in the future. So pharmacy is just more than, more than just a university environment. It's a whole educational activity. And in Cardiff, we believe I have a balance right of both that academic side, but also skill development to produce really strong uh, students. And why do it? Well, pharmacists are in demand. Uh, and what you're gonna have is a positive impact. And we've actually seen an increase in that during the, the pandemic. I'm sure many of you have seen the pressures that are on in the NHS. It's currently going through that now, but actually pharmacists at the front line were a major part of being getting through the pandemic. And now we're playing a major role in terms of the rollout to the vaccination process, the rollout of other support systems to help take some of the pressure off doctors. We're easy accessible. So no matter what sector you go and work in, you're going to make a difference in terms of helping someone. And as I indicated at the very beginning, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help people. And in fact, my research in the last year and a bit from my research group and colleagues, we've been able to help hospital patients who have COVID. We're making uh, data or generating data to help them through that process and to, to make sure they're safe or others who don't have COVID but want to stay at home, we can get the treatment in their home environment. So there's a whole range of activities that pharmacists can do to make sure they can help and benefit patients. So why? Well, pharmacists are experts in multiple areas. If you want to think of us as jack of all trades, uh, we have knowledge base in these areas. These are what we define as our main areas of knowledge. So firstly, medicinal chemistry. So the designing of the regional molecule, shaping them, manipulating them. Yes. You can do this in a, a pure chemistry sense. And in Cardiff University, we have a chemistry department who helps in that process. Whereas a pharmacist, this is just a subset. So we have other areas that allow us to build on that area. Once we've got a molecule, we need to understand how it's going to work in the human body, what its toxicology like, its pathways, how is it going to be removed if we've given it as a, a medicinal form. So this is the pharmacology the action of the drugs, understanding them, et cetera. And again, in Cardiff University, we have a, a medical pharmacology course. So both pure courses can be available to you. The difference to those pure courses, while you're looking at those particular areas, that's all you're doing, is those areas almost in isolation and you're not working with patients. But these are subsets of our knowledge that we have to have if we're going to go forward and work with medicines themselves. The next area, the area that I work in is then called pharmaceutics, and that's taking one of those molecules that's been shown to work and now convert it into a dosage form, a tablet, a capsule. In my case, it's around injectable dosage forms. So we're making sure that the drug is stable and safe within that form, that the patient can use it in a nice, easy way or a doctor can give it to them thinking about delivery mechanisms, how can we make it easier? And this is unique uh, to pharmacists, thinking about this formulation side of it. So this is our scientific knowledge, these three areas. Of course, what we do then is use that knowledge to help us in what we call the clinical setting. So choosing the medicine, helping the doctor or a patient choose the right medicine for their particular illness, making sure we can supply it in the correct dosage form, in the right form that's useful for that patient. So I work with Cardiff and Vale or and other hospitals about premature babies. They need food in a specialized form. They're born early, 
they can't mum can't supply them then we can give them injections their food substance in injectable form that only they can use we also know that once we give medicines to patients we need to make sure that they're working correctly so we're in an ideal place to review those medications particularly long term checking how the drugs are effective are the patients developing side effects or adverse reactions and because we've been doing all of this for such a long time period and because we are the experts in what we call medicine management then we're seeing a growing need for pharmacists to also get involved in prescribing and this has been in place for over 10 years now and as i indicated going forward the foundation training year will also have pharmacists actually prescribing as they leave university rather than or not university as they they finish that training year whereas in the past they've had to specialize and then come back and do postgraduate training to to get that uh, that advantage so we have pharmacists working out there in practice using these skill set to help patients in multiple areas so where are these career opportunities? Well, the obvious and most commonly known one is obviously that of what we call community pharmacy. Some people think of it as shop pharmacy. So we obviously have small corner shop pharmacists, individual companies, right through to the big multinationals like Boots, the chemist. Their patients going in, obviously, with their prescriptions, getting their medicines filled, or but they're also going in to buy over-the-counter medicines, seeking advice about their medicines, even advice about the healthcare lifestyle. They play sport, they're worried about the drugs they're taking. Will this, uh, you know, is this allowed and stuff like that? We're also seeing what we will call additional services. I've mentioned the vaccination process. So I've been this morning actually myself to get a flu vaccine at a local pharmacy. So I'm going to see this. And what we're seeing is additional services around blood pressure monitoring, cholesterol monitoring, smoking cessation. And here, if we're having a pharmacist do these services, why then send that patient off to a doctor if there, there is something wrong when a pharmacist could potentially prescribe them? And this is why we're seeing pharmacists maybe taking away some of the minor ailment patients, patients who are not so, so ill that they need additional services, but the ones who are more serious or maybe need to more ex extensive examination, these will then go on to the doctors or the, the hospitals on the direction of the pharmacist. So we screen them out. So this is a, a vital service for us. Next area of pharmacy, the biggest area will probably be that of what we call hospital pharmacy. So here we have a range of activities that the pharmacist can work in. Clinical pharmacy is the interaction of the pharmacist with the patients themselves, whether this is at ward level as part of the ward rounds or as part of clinics uh, for longer term patients. Down on the bottom left hand side, you can see there in the striped top, that's the pharmacist there at the ward reviewing the medication. Historically, and as a pharmacist in the hospital, I used to go up to the wards take part, then have to go back to pharmacy to count out the pills or box the tablets up and then send them up to the ward. But as you can see in the picture on the top, actually we now have robots doing this. So the pharmacist stays at the ward, is interacting a lot more with the patients and the, the staff there making sure the medicines are used. So when the robot has dispensed it, checked by a technician, sent back to the ward, and then the pharmacist can guide the patient and the staff at the ward to make sure it's being used correctly. As I indicated, though, we don't just have clinical pharmacists, we have pharmacists in supporting roles. So uh, I work with the group of hospital pharmacists in the next area, and that's the preparation and the manufacture of medicines, specialized medicines that you can't necessarily buy off the shelf, particularly around injections. So we're here in the background. We also have medical information staff. So these are pharmacists with extensive resources, particularly around the internet that they can go searching for information. So a doctor or a patient needs to know more about the drugs or the potential of this drug in a particular situation. They can ask a question that pharmacist will go and find the latest information and then correspond with them, get back to them and identify what would be a way forward. As hospitals have become pressurized, what we're also seeing then is a growing uh, route of treatment, and that is for patients to have their treatments at home. We call these home care services. So patients are now going into hospital, getting diagnosed, but then going home for follow-ups. So things like antibiotic therapy, even cancer therapy sometimes, parental nutrition where patients can't eat are being fed at their home fluid therapy, pain relief, there's a whole range of them. So here we need technical support, maybe pharmacists guiding them, making sure things are safe for the patients while they use these medicines at home. So they're a growing area for pharmacists to monitor these patients, to review them. And of course, then prescribing comes into this, where we're running clinics, 
well, we're working with tech services, why not have prescribing pharmacists? And hospital was the first area that really this took off and continues to be uh, require pharmacists with prescribing abilities. Of course, these aren't the only other areas. Uh, there are others in supporting. So obviously, if we're going to have medicines, we need someone to make them. So the pharmaceutical industry looks out for pharmacists. Their unique knowledge and ability allows them to work in multiple areas, not just maybe just in one specialist area. So we can be involved in the, the research development areas, the clinical trials, production, regulatory affairs, even in the marketing. So if you like selling things, there's an opportunity there for a pharmacist where maybe someone with a pure degree would struggle to work in all areas because they're more narrowed in their focus. Of course, there's teaching and research. I never thought myself I would get into this area for a very enjoyable time, thinking of the future, helping people. And my research is what we call practical and based, applied. It's research that allows patients to get their drugs in a particular form very quickly, not having to wait 10, 11 years maybe down the line. So there's different types of research that can take place. In more recent years, as prescribing has come to the fore and as medicines have become more complex, then we've also seen pharmacists move into newer areas. So I've not worked in these, but I know many of the pharmacists are now going out and working there. So GP practices, why? Well, as I indicated, medicines are expensive, and particularly for the elderly patient who may be on five, six, seven, eight different medicines, it's very useful to have what we call a medical use review. And the best person to review that person would be a pharmacist to look at exactly what's happening with those medicines. Are they effective? Is the patient taking them? Are there side effects that are causing them to have to take another medicine? So pharmacists are unique in that ability to help out. And so we're finding unique roles in there. We're also seeing pharmacists in, in hospitals in another area that wasn't traditional, and that's accident and emergency department. So again, the stats show that many elderly patients who arrive in an A&E department, particularly if they've had a fall, why have they fallen? Well, it's a result typically often of their medicines causing them either to become drowsy or they've taken their medicines incorrect. And therefore, again, pharmacists have a role here. Why? Because we're really good at drug history taking, finding out and interrogating the patient to exactly what were medicines they were on, what were they taking, what, was, what happened. That allows then us to build an information base to help the clinical staff then decide the way forward for that patient, what's going to happen with them. As and then the final area is what we call primary care, secondary care. So the hospital is secondary care, primary care is out the patients in their own homes, that home care move. As we see patients, then we're needing pharmacists to work in overlapping areas to actually go and meet the patients in their homes to see how they're getting on, particularly in rural areas, but we're also seeing it in city areas. So there's growing areas for pharmacists and who knows where else pharmacists with prescribing abilities will go forward. So these are just some examples of where you would possibly like to go and work. So that's pharmacy per se. So I encourage you to think about it. I think it's still a very valuable and great career, but where do you want to get educated? Well, we believe we're the best school of pharmacy in the country. If you look at all the ranking tables, yes, you typically only talk about them when you're near the top, or we can luckily talk about them. And in fact, in the latest Guardian Lee table, you'll find us at the top uh, in terms of England and Wales uh, as the number one school of pharmacy. And if you look at the other league tables, again, you'll also find us very near the top and have done over the years. We're an old established school, we use, but progressive in the way we teach. We are always adapting it to make it fit for purpose. And don't just trust what I'm saying. If you go on the General Pharmaceutical Council, you'll be able to see the reports from what they call accreditation visits. They go to each individual school at set intervals to check what is going in with that school. Is it fit for purpose? Are they teaching in the right way? So we have a long history of proving to our professional body that we're capable and one of the best. The best thing about our school, of course, is we've got to get the students in, but we've also then got to get them out. We've got to get them to that pre-registration foundation training year. If you can't do that, you can't go on to register as a pharmacist. And we're very proud of the fact that we get 100% of our students and have done for many, many years. I've been there over 30 years, and I can only think of a tiny, tiny uh, handful of students who've been unable to get to pre-reg. But it's not just getting to pre-reg, it's then about passing that pre-registration training year. And again, we have stats 
again, available on the General Pharmaceutical Council to show we're one of the best in terms of our students' performances uh, at that year group or that year end. So our pharmacists are not only just graduating, going on to pre-reg, but they're graduating from pre-reg directly onto the registration and registration as pharmacists. So we see them out and around in practice. So how can we do that? Well, as it's indicated, one of the start points is the, the course itself. The curriculum is ever changing to reflect the role of the pharmacist. So the professional body includes that. So one of the live things about this is, is making sure we're fit for purpose. So we're getting our students out into placements, getting them to see what's going on in real life. So we send them out in all different range of placements to make sure they see the, those activities. This is a placement they typically do in the very first couple of weeks with us. So these are first year students and they go out in a, a, a local volunteering scheme with the local hospitals. So they actually thrust into the, that environment very quickly, not as pharmacists, but as volunteers so that it can see the environment that the NHS works in to meet NHS staff, to meet patients. That helps them understand then the context of what they're learning the science about. So we have a whole range of these, what we call experiential uh, learning placements. So hospital, community, yes, traditional pharmacy environments, but GP surgery, sitting on a DSA, so disability uh, survey allowances. Uh, so checking patients uh, if they're ill, you know, what medicine they're on and stuff like that. So pharmacists, so pharmacy students are exposed to these and it helps them understand where pharmacy you're going. We also, we're unique in Cardiff University having a full set of healthcare related courses so we can interact with them. So here we talk about interprofessional education. Obviously we work a lot with the medical school since medics and pharmacists are, uh, are very closely working out in practice. And here we can see uh, a number of pictures of those activities that we do them, but we don't just do it with medics. We do other activities with the optometry students, but also with the dental students, since both of those professions, uh, they use medicines for their patients. So it's good for them to understand the role of the pharmacist. So what type of activities we're we doing? Well, on the bottom right, you can see students there doing heart compressions or chest compressions on, uh, on dummies. So this is first aid. So they do this almost immediately. So we have a range of pharmacy and medical students. So as healthcare professionals, you'd expect if you're walking out in the street, someone collapses, you should be able to help them. Above them, we have some students who are on the placement. You can see them talking to a nurse about the medication. In this case, it's a, an intravenous pump or a pump that's being used to provide medicines. They're learning on the job about what's going on. And down on the left-hand side, so again, they're seeing those real-life scenarios. Top left there, we have pharmacy students looking at lung function testing. So we're doing all these skills sets these interactions that when they go out in real life, a pharmacy student would appreciate what a doctor does. A doctor will understand what a pharmacist does. And these are almost unique to us in Cardiff in terms of that ability to interact with all these other professions. And um, we're still looking for more around nursing and physiotherapy as well. Alongside that, then we also look at traditional areas. So this is an area that I'm involved in. So this is the manufacture of drugs. So here we have pictures here of our sterile manufacturing suite. So this is part of a million pounds spent over 10 years ago to develop an area where we can make tablets and, uh, and injections in real life scenarios. So these mimic exactly what you'll find out in practice. So although we don't produce drugs for patients, the students can have a go at making them in the same conditions. So I would give lectures about how to make injections. They go into our big practical teaching lab. They'd have a go on a small scale and then they go in to see what it's like making real life drugs. So here we have guidance from Cardiff and Vale. So they do activities in the same way as the local hospital are doing. So they're not just looking here at how to make them, but also the paperwork, the checking processes, the risk management that goes associated with, they can see how difficult it is and thinking about the environment. So these are what we refer to as clean rooms, keeping the conditions clean, because in this case for an injection, a single contaminant, can become life-threatening to a patient. So that life-supporting drug can actually be made life-threatening if not made correctly, if not made used correctly. So the students write like that real life, uh, real life realism that goes with it. Of course, the other side of it then is the clinical setting. How do we mimic that or what do we do? So in real life, of course, we've got all the different modules. We're testing your knowledge as you go on, written exams. We're gonna write reports. You're gonna do presentations. 
or one of the things that's important as a pharmacist is what we call our communication skills. So one of the assessments we do is what's called an OSCE, Objective clinic, uh, Structured Clinical Examinations. So in this case, what we have is a pharmacy student interacting with a patient. In Cardiff, we have lots of actors who work on things like Doctor Who and Torchwood and other TV series. So we get them to come in and they, they play a patient. And we tell them to play angry patients, deaf patients, an angry or a patient who's got a, a crying baby. And the pharmacist student then has to interact with them around a particular scenario. The scenario only lasts about eight minutes. But what they're marked on, you can see in the forefront, is the academic staff who's marking them. And he's marking them on their, the words they're using, the way they interact, how confident they are. Are they talking? Are they observing what's going on in this? Are they you know, making eye contact? And we have a series of consultation rooms in which we do these activities. So this is a vital skill. And we do it throughout all of the course, growing in complex nature, or the stations growing complex uh, complexity as we go forward. So by the time they get to the fourth year, they should be ready for real life scenarios out in practice. As up until recently, the only school of pharmacy in Wales, we're still number one in, in terms of going forward. We also realise that the Welsh language is important. Certain parts of Wales, then patients, when they become ill, they want to speak to healthcare professionals in their, well, their first language, so Welsh. So what we do is some of the clinical training activities we also will replicate in Welsh. So for Welsh speaking students, there's an opportunity to gain additional skill sets that may help you in your future careers. And we keep developing this range to help our students and obviously the healthcare areas about the role of the pharmacist in this important area for us. So I've tried to then cover what we do as the School of Pharmacy, I've tried to indicate to you that we believe we're the best and show you why we believe we're the best. So what are we looking for? Well, partly is that process starts in picking the right students. We're not just looking for pure academic students. <coughs> as you can see, pharmacy is involved in communication. We're looking for other things. So, so we're looking for a range of abilities Obviously, science is high, but other activities. So typically, we're looking for around 150 students. There is competition, so we get more applicants than we have places available uh, on our course. So that's why we're looking out, and hopefully today we'll help you in guiding you what we're looking for to help you through that process. Virtually all of our, our places are made available or, or offers are made via the, the first cycle. So that's open now uh, until mid-January. So get your personal statement in early, get your information early. The advantage of that is we do interviews, which I'll come into shortly. So the earlier you get your application in, then the earlier you'll have that interview. That allows you then to get through that process, maybe relax and concentrate on your then your examinations. Your personal statement is important to us. We want to know about you, the person, why you're interested in pharmacy, the background of why you're choosing it, something about any work experience, and we know work experience has been difficult in the pandemic. So we're not asking you to have a job. We're not asking you sometimes, depending on where in the country, to even have gone to, to get into a pharmacy, but talk to pharmacists, find out about what their role is. Think about volunteering, go and see medicines being used. If you're applying to medicine, then think about you know, what they're looking for that and how that can be reflected uh, for pharmacy. One thing to note, if you are applying to medicine and pharmacies, when your backup choices, do not mention pharmacy on your medical school placement, a medical uh, a personal statement. They tend not to like that. But what we will do if that application comes into us, we will ask you to write a dedicated pharmacy statement and you just send us that by email and then we use that going forward. Additionally, what we're also as indicated is we want to know about you, the person. Any sport, music, drama, any additional volunteering, anything that shows you do other activities that might have skill sets, teamwork and communication, et cetera, that we can use. In terms of academic side of it, obviously a lot of that is written down for us. It will come from your teachers, your A-levels, your GCSEs, your IBs, et cetera. But tell us if you're doing an EPQ, if you're doing a, a Welsh back, if the topic is medical based, that could be of interest to us and obviously something we can talk to you about in terms of breaking up uh, the interview process to help us get more relaxed and insight into you, the person. In terms of your GCSEs, obviously we're looking for high quality in terms of the sciences. There are some university minimum standards, so in terms of English and maths, we're looking for Bs uh, going forward. And then at A level, we're looking typically for students. We're gonna, our, our offer is going to be two A's and a B. 
These will include either chemistry or biology as number one A-level, then either the second A-level being chemistry, biology, maths, or physics, with the third A-level can be any other the subject, except for general studies, critical thinking. It can be in the case of Welsh students doing the Welsh back, the Welsh back, although ideally you do the Welsh back alongside three A-levels, but the overall will be ABB is our standard offer. And typically it's an open offer. We don't specify grades against a particular subject unless we identify weaknesses during the interview process. In terms of IB, then we're looking for equivalences. And similarly, if you're a, a mature student with another degree, then we'll be looking typically for a first class honours degree uh, to show it in a science based subject. But we will look at every bit of your qualifications. So if you've got untypical qualifications, send us information and we can review it and tell you what we'd be looking for. Cardiff University and the School of Pharmacy are involved in the widening access policy. So uh, we look at everything in terms of uh, information on your uh, application. So contextualized admission supplies. So depending what school you are, where you're living, what your father and mother did, et cetera, we use that information. So if you are from a disadvantaged background, for instance, that will take into consideration. And potentially it could be for uh, a contextualized applicant that a standard offer would be reduced down to an A and two Bs uh, as an alternate offer for them, knowing on the circumstances that they're coming forward. So the interview is there to help us in terms of screening students. Think of it almost as a D selection interview. We're looking for weaknesses. If you come in and you can't tell, tell us your name, you can't, you, you burst into tears, we have some concerns there. Hopefully you should be able to answer basic academic questions that are related around your, 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 your academic subjects. But the rest is about you telling us as a person that we believe you're going to be the right student for Cardiff University uh, going forward. So there's interviews uh, that are being conducted and have been traditionally between the mid-November and early April. Uh, during the pandemic, we switched to Zoom, and in fact, we're going to stick with Zoom uh, this year going forward. We believe it's a good way of equalising issues around transportation, the concerns still people will have. It allows us to, to conduct them, so uh, make sure you've got a good connection uh, for that. Our interviews are 30 minutes with one-on-one -on -one with an academic member of staff. As I say, going through those uh, your personal statements, looking at your academic background, getting to talk to you about pharmacists and the pharmacy role, about their knowledge and your skill set that they have and you have over the overlap. That's important to us. And we will also include what we call an ethical dilemma type question, uh, simply because majority of our students do go on to the NHS. The NHS has a principle of recruitment that includes around values-based recruitment. Are you going to be safe to work with patients in the future? So building that all together. You know, whilst a lot of students, when they first come or applicants come to us, a little bit worried about the interview, actually we get very positive feedback and the enjoyment they actually have had from that interview. They've learned them about a little bit about themselves, but about the process and pharmacy itself. So hopefully you would do so uh, as well. So I say, get in early, get your interview early, then you can obviously then concentrate on, on your academic side of things. So hopefully what I've tried to cover today is a whistle-stop tour about becoming a pharmacist, what pharmacists do, what the range of skills pharmacists are looking for. I hope I've convinced you that pharmacy is a great opportunity. I certainly don't ever regret becoming a pharmacist. I still would set out to go there. In fact, my own son has just started to become a pharmacist uh, himself. So he's looking forward to that. So I convinced him that it was an opportunity to be a scientist, yet helping people. And that was something he wanted to do. And I'm still doing it day to day. I don't meet a patient, though. My difference is my research is, is my link to patients. And I value that. But you could find a role directly involved with patients. You could find a role a little bit further away. It's entirely up to you. We will give you the skill set. We will make sure you have the right knowledge base to work in the right area of you, the right area of practice. Obviously, if you do become, want to become a pharmacist, then we hope you think of Cardiff as the number one place. We believe we're the best school of pharmacy in the country, but hopefully you've seen an insight of what we do. But go have a look. Have a look on the General Pharmaceutical website. I say they have lots of details about all the different schools, how they perform, what they think good and bad about them from their accreditation visits, and we'll happily uh, stand ourselves against those. As the Lee table shows, we have a long history uh, of doing this. We have got a Q&A coming up, 
obviously if you're a little bit shy or you don't want to, to put a question in today or after today you've suddenly thought of a question please do not hesitate send us an email have a look on our website have a look around we have a range of social media activities going on obviously on the weekend is the open day we are open so we hopefully get to see some of you in the department whilst numbers are, uh, are limited because of covid restrictions we are trying to open up but hopefully we can convince you and there will be other open days coming up in the future so if you can't make this weekend hopefully you may be able to come one of the others but we're here to help and what we're going to do now i'm going to stop sharing my slides uh, lisa is going to come and join me and we're going to go through some of the questions uh, that you may have presented to us but hopefully uh, you, we've convinced you and hopefully you you've enjoyed this talk but thank you thanks alan that's okay um okay so we've had a few questions coming in while you've been speaking um the first one going back to the personal statement again i know you've touched on it yep. um it being difficult to get work experience and shadowing pharmacists um will this be a disadvantage if this is not included in the statement no uh so we're, we're conscious that you know there has been difficulties it even before the pandemic can have difficulties depending where you live in, in the country you know we've had people apply to us from the scottish highlands you know there may not even be a pharmacy on that, that island so how do they find out so it's not a requirement to come to the school of pharmacy with a personal statement that says you've got pharmacy work experience but what you've got to do though is find out more about what it's involved what does pharmacy involve that could be by as i indicated doing volunteering maybe in a nursing home seeing medicines being used having a look at that talking to a pharmacist or going on very good websites like the gphc like the rps to build up your knowledge base what we find is the students who have been able to talk to pharmacists or other healthcare pair healthcare professionals or find out about meds and use etc they are able to answer those questions we ask maybe around the role of the pharmacist what does a pharmacist do in a particular scenario so it is valuable for you to do it but it's not a requirement and if you're struggling if you're not sure send us an email and we may be able to help you and guide you with what you could do as an alternate okay okay that's great um what happens if you miss out on your offer by one grade Okay, so this happens every year that we make more offers than we have places available. So we get the results typically about not quite a week in advance of them being released on A-level result day in August. What we're doing then is matching the people who've met the grades, they automatically are in, they've met their conditions of the offer. And then we look to see what places we have left available. And then obviously we rank the students depending on what they've missed on how far they are away from their target, uh, their interview process, etc. All of these are used then to determine, right, you may have missed, but it's only a little bit. We've got a place we'll allow you in. If you're too far away, obviously, then obviously the chances are that process happening and there's still being places we may not be able to take you. This year, of course, uh, we had the opposite. We had given out lots of places. Then the grades were made not by examinations, by the CAGs, the centre assess grades. We have more people then hit their target. As a result, we have far more students in our first year than we've ever had in, in our department before because they've met their target, they've met the offer conditions. So it does vary every year. But the idea is get close to it, actually meet it, you're in with us. We have no choice but to take you, okay? Thank you, that's great. Um, one question here on the content of the course are experiments a key part of studying pharmacy so i guess that refers to the kind of lab activity yeah so lab work is so we yes uh, pharmacists yes we are moving more clinical in our work but there's still a need to understand how drugs are made so we, uh, our students will be doing uh, chemistry practicals they'll do some pharmacology stuff they certainly do formulation activities, laboratory stuff with me. I know in the next two weeks, the first year students will do some microbiology practicals. So they're a vital part of our, our learning process. Maybe we don't do as many as we used to. So for instance, I have masses of time spent in the laboratory, but that was because of the role of the pharmacist in those days wasn't so clinically focused. So some of our practical classes have shrunk, but being replaced then by placement activities because the role, they need that skill set and the role set has changed for the pharmacist, but hopefully that will help you. Okay. That's great. Um, 
similar to the offer grade one lower, um, someone's asked if they get ABB um, and the interview goes well, um, could they get in on that or is AAB the minimum that they need? No, so, so as indicated, our standard offer will be two A's and a B. That's our offer conditions. Uh, you know, as I indicate, there may be the other case, student who will get a contextualized offer, but that's standard offer. So you have to hit the target to be guaranteed. But for instance, if you got in on ABB, if you had ABB and we had places available, it's almost certain that you get in if you perform well at your interview. But I say it does vary every year. This year was totally different. I've been doing admissions for nearly 15 years. It's the first year we've gone well over target. Other years, we've had to fill with students who've missed out, maybe gone two grades down below that. And we've maybe sometimes had to go occasionally to clearing to fill up our places. So it varies every year. The easiest answer, if you meet your target, you meet your offer conditions, you are in. We have no choice. You have to come to, or we have no choice. You will come to us because you've got the guaranteed place. That's great. Um, during the interview process, uh, is the applicant allowed to have notes with them and a copy of their personal statement to help them during the interview? Yes, uh, w students will do so. You know, obviously, we want you much more relaxed and in theory, you should know more about your personal statement than anyone. Uh, this is a Zoom interview. So if you've got open material stuck to a wall either side or on another computer screen, we're not going to stop you. That doesn't stop you. But obviously, we don't want you reading pre-written notes. You know, this is an answer. You've gone online. We know that there are certain forums out there where people put up the questions they've asked, and then people go and to almost like revise those questions. But they don't come across then as a natural answer. And sometimes we change the questions, you know, subtly. We don't just use the same question on every single applicant. We have a bank of questions and it will vary depending on your background, your academic background, your predictions, your, your grades, your personal statements. So it will vary a little bit. We want you to be natural, but yes, you can have some material uh, stuck to your computer or helping you if that relaxes you a little bit, okay? That's great, Al. Um, just a comment here from Sophie. She says it's been an inspiring talk and she's excited about the prospect of applying. So great. thank you for thank that. You. We look <laughs> yeah, we look forward to an application. <laughs> Lovely. Um, and the next question, uh, interview based again, what sort of chemistry questions will be asked um, and what kind of level is that? Difficult or basic chemistry uh, knowledge? They're, they're not rocket science questions there'll be something based around something you will have learned sometimes we'll link that too so for instance a question could be a patient is going to swallow a tablet where does it go so you think that's a biology question but actually it goes down into the stomach which is an acidic environment so we may talk about ph we may talk about buffering how we can change that so we're going to change things we may ask you uh, provide you you know tell us the structure of a uh, a benzene, for instance, and what, what, why its properties, what's different about it than maybe a, a, a particular functional group. So they will vary, uh, and it depends on, on you know, what we're seeing in terms of it. You know, what we tend to do is spend more time, uh, certainly with students who are getting really good predictions, we're going to spend more time on the clinical side of it, the other side of it. Where a student maybe later in the year is coming to us with maybe weaker predictions, particularly if they've got weak abilities or we've seen weakness maybe at the GCSE and the sciences then we may interrogate them a little bit more uh, about the chemistry side of it or a particular topic biology for instance if we think there is a weakness in that area but as I say these are deselection interviews we're looking for good performance you're all starting well be confident in your answers and you should have an offer as a result of that. That's great, thank you. Um, in terms of the subject combination, is psychology allowed as the second science? I'm afraid it's not. So uh, we do not consider it uh, a second science. So as I said, the sciences we allowed for, for A-levels one and two are chemistry, biology, maths and physics. So uh, a combination of those. So chemistry or biology, either or. Then one, obviously, if you've chosen chemistry in A-level one, then we'd expect biology could be A-level two but it could also be maths or physics uh, alongside it. Your majority or quite a lot of our students with chemistry, 
biology and mathematics, that's the ideal combination, but certainly chemistry, biology and a language. Since pharmacists are communicating with patients, uh, those students also do very well in those scenarios. We will have some students who come to us, although few in number, who don't have chemistry at all at A-level, but they may have to work a little bit hard, the same as we'll have students who don't have biology at A-level. Again, they tend to have to work a little bit harder to make sure they're up to speed in those areas. And certainly as pharmacy has gone more clinical, then there's actually more biology on our course than chemistry these days, which is why we moved away. I think it's three years ago, we moved away where you had to have chemistry to a position now where it's, you have to have either chemistry or biology. But I'm afraid psychology doesn't stand up as one of our, our second A-level. So it could be a third A-level only, I'm afraid. Thank you, Al. Um, what stands out to you on a personal statement? Um, I think it firstly is showing us or telling us why you've chosen pharmacy, you know, the background of what it could be. For some people, that could be a human involvement from your own family, a family member or your own self who's ex been exposed to an illness, had to use medicine. So therefore, you've seen healthcare working to help that person to, or, your, or yourself going forward. So you've got that insight at the very beginning. Then that person has stepped out to do some work experience, not necessarily say in pharmacy, but volunteering. But they understand what it's. It's not about just standing there and watching. But what have they got out of that experience, the skill set? What is the pharmacist doing? Communicating with the patient, seeing the empathy with the patient, seeing maybe a, a nurse giving a, a, an elderly patient who can't swallow. How are they giving those tablets to the patients? So an insight. Often the students who've done EPQs are Welsh back, you know, the essays, the big, long projects, and they have a real detailed knowledge of that product. And they've shown us those students can also stand out very much. And then finally, we want you to sell us, as I indicated about yourself. So good sports people. We've had professional sports people, male and female athletes going forward. And often they will have dedication to that sport and they use those dedicated skills in pharmacy. So they show that abilities going forward. So it's an opportunity to sell yourself, not just on the piece of paper, but then when you translate that across into that person we see in the interview. So it's not necessarily all your written words, but how you convey those words and what it means to us. Think of what a pharmacist you want to be and what we're expecting, okay? Thank you. Um, when do you start the prescribing part of the course? So we're in the process of changing. So our current first year students at the moment are still on the same course of all others, but from next year onwards, they're going to have a slightly adjusted course. It will start to separate with more information. We already run postgraduate prescribing. So what we're gonna be doing is bringing some of that teaching down into the undergraduate course during years two, three, and four. But also we're linking with then the people who do the pre-reg, the foundation training. So some of it will be taught in the university, but some of it will be taught while you're on the job. So you get an understanding of it. It's all changing at the moment. It's still being laid out. And what we will have next year, and I think two years after that, is reaccreditation visits, particularly around how we're changing our course to reflect that. And every university in is going to go through that. So I'm not fully involved in that process, but you will see if you keep an eye out on the General Pharmaceutical Council and you come back to us maybe later in the year as we, we appreciate more how those changes are going to go forward, we'll be able to relay more information in this. But the idea is, in practice, that at the end of the training year, you should be able to prescribe or will have the skill set for prescribing. Whether legally you'll be able to prescribe, I'm not quite sure yet. That still has to be approved. Thank you, Al. Um, we have several questions here which are very similar, so I'll try and yep. ask them all in one go. Um, it's about predicted grades on the UCAS form. Yep. So um, basically, what predicted grades are you considering before you offer an interview? For instance, if someone has three Bs or yep. a, a B, B, would they would that still be enough to get them to interview stage on predictions? Yeah. So our target is, as I've indicated, is two A's and a B. But actually, a realization that some students are going to push themselves and get better than prediction. So for the last, I don't know how many years, five years, I think it is, uh, uh, we've interviewed anyone who's predicted three Bs and above uh, with also then 
flagging that up that if we have a student who has contextualized background we may open up that window a little bit more so they may have prediction of two b's and a c our expectation then is that they'll do well at interview but also we then set them the standard target two a's and a b and it's down to that student actually to show us that whilst that prediction was low they have the ability to go forward and get the grades that we're looking for so that's what we're looking for so that's where we use predictions in the past, of course, AS grades were available for us to look at. For many students now, we don't get ASs. They're not cached or you don't sit them at all. So it is purely. But where we had AS grades available, we could review, we could see some realism around those predictions. So someone obviously had two E's or three E's at, uh, and then we're told they were going to get three A's. That's not realistic prediction. So we don't have as much information. So we set realism. We will review. At the moment, our expectation, though, is we will be looking at three Bs and above unless you're contextualised. That's great. Thank you. Um, have you, this is a good one, have you ever given out unconditional offers? Um, I'm th thinking before they've had the grades. And if yes, what was it about the person that made you do this? OK, so I've been 15 years in the department. We've never given unconditional offers. We do not believe they're right for the students. and They're not right for us. So a student can end up with an unconditional offer, but they've had to pass their interview. And basically, they already have to have their qualifications in place. We set them a target. We say, this is your offer. Now show us that you have the certificates and the results to confirm you have them. And only then do you get confirmed to an unconditional. There are other schools of pharmacy I'm aware of that actually do give out unconditional offers and we do not believe it's right. UCAS do not believe it's right, but we can't stop them from happening. Uh, and the idea is they're incentivizing you to go and uh, go to them, uh, sometimes with additional benefits, money, etc. A computer I've heard of in the past, we don't think that's good for you. And often some students will then say, right, I'm not, I don't have to work hard in my A-levels. But what happens then later in life when you look back and certainly your job prospects they may look back at that so we do not believe in them and we do not give them out in cardiff thank you al um if on results day um a person doesn't get the results do we have a foundation year you can apply for um instead uh, afraid we don't cardiff university only has a foundation course for international students so for students who have qualifications from overseas who do not match up to A-levels, so uh, for example, many in Middle East countries, their upper A-level, as it were, A-level equivalent is only equivalent to an AS. So they've missed one year of study in comparison to a, a, a UK-based student. So they have to do additional studies and we use a foundation course for that. All other students, if they missed out on the grades, or the grades too low, we will expect them to reset their A-levels or do additional qualifications to get up to, to scratch. If you're a UK student, we do not accept foundation qualifications uh, as alternates. There are other schools of pharmacy, though, that do so. Uh, so obviously it does vary, but for us in kind of raid our ability, we, we suggest going back and resetting. And in fact, what we allow is students three years to get their A-levels, if you had extenuating circumstances for all, for instance, illness or a family reason, then it could be a longer period to get those A-levels, but you should be able to get them to the grades that we're looking for. Thank you, Al. Um, how long after sending your UCAS application off will it be until they hear anything um, about an interview or an offer? Uh, so the, the, the initial time periods are, are typically pretty small we try to get them out so we've got students coming in now who, who are applying uh basically all the medical schools they have to get an applications in by mid-october i think it is or end of october i can't remember the exact date uh so once we've got a bank of those students who who want to apply to card if we then start getting information out to them to say look we want you to come for an interview uh, and we'll basically lisa's role that's lisa she will then set up an interview a zoom date give you a selection of those typically here's a date if it's not suitable we'll change it for you but once you have the interview typically within seven to ten days you should see your result whether you've been made an offer or not so it's the initial part while we're setting up the interview is the the more slower part 
Uh, but if you're in the system, we will tr you know, screen you, process you as quickly as possible, whether it's negative or positive, and then get back to you and then say the interview process once it's up and running. So that's why I'm saying if you maybe get your application in before Christmas, uh, just before the Christmas deadline, you may get an interview then in, in February. If you apply in January, just for the, the end of the first cycle, you may end up not having your interview until much later, you know, towards April, depending on that, that number. So that's why we encourage students to get their applications in now. All the good schools of pharmacy and all schools of pharmacy are doing interviews or an equivalent to an interview. That's a requirement of the professional body now. They will you know, you could have all your interviews before Christmas, which allows you then to, to concentrate on any exams or assessments you have in the new year to allow you to fully have a go at getting those grades that we're looking for. Yeah, thank you, Al. Yeah, just, just to back up what Alan said, those who are applying now, we're starting to look at interviews around about the 10th of November onwards. Um, and once you are interviewed, yes, we try and get that offer onto UCAS track within about uh, 10 days to two weeks after the interview, so you know fairly quickly. Um, so subject, subject combinations, um, maths, chemistry and economics, um, acceptable for consideration now? Yes, that's fine. Uh, obviously there, uh, you just need to have biology at a lower level or general science uh, at your GCSE, sorry. In your situation, if we then made you an offer, what we would highly recommend to you is get a human biology textbook uh, so that between the time of your schooling and starting a course, because there is a lot of biology on the course, to get yourself back up to speed. It's not about understanding everything in the book, but being familiar with the words, etc. So, yes, that combination is acceptable uh, to us. Thank you, Al. Um, if a, a student is studying a fourth A-level subject, will this make any difference to our consideration or the offer, this four uh, subjects? Yeah, no. In fact, we don't think it's the best idea uh, in terms of basically we're only looking for three. It's the same with medicine. It's look for uh, all universities. We're looking for the best three. Now, if you can do four A-levels and it's not going to hurt your performance in terms of getting grades on the other ones, that is down to you. But ultimately, if you do a fourth A-level, that means you're going to then struggle on getting the grades for the first three, that could lead to poor performance. We wouldn't recommend it. So for us, it's entirely up to you. you know, we've had people applying with five and six A-levels in the past. Why? Madness. It benefits the school. It doesn't benefit necessarily you. We're looking for three high-quality grades subjects as indicated to get those grades that we're looking for the fourth one is for your benefit maybe it shows an interest in the area but it's not going to help you in terms of getting an offer i'm afraid thank you al um in terms of how many total applications do you get um how many on average each year do we have coming in um well, you can back me up here, Lisa. Yeah. I, think, I think normally yeah. we're, we're interviewing somewhere in the region of 500 uh, students. Yeah, we're normally getting about 700 applicants, maybe. Obviously, there are a group of those that don't meet the entry criteria, don't have the right subjects. They're not at the predicted levels. So then we whittle that down. And I'd say typically most years around the 500 mark, even some years a little bit higher in terms of the number of interviews. And what we're looking ideally to have then around 200, 250 students applying for those 150 odd places we're looking at with then obviously some of them not getting the grades later in the year so this is almost like a funneling effect to get down there but it does vary at the moment uh, certainly last year our applications went up we believe that's on the back of the pandemic pharmacy was seen as more high profile a good career path pharmacy helping in the healthcare areas whereas maybe some of the other traditional areas people would have looked at dentistry and optometry haven't been so successful uh, during the pandemic because they've been shut because they're close nature of working patients. But it's ultimately down to you to be part of that. Okay. And it's just important to remember that if we, we offer you a conditional offer to get AAB and you get those, that offer exactly, then, you know, your place would be secure with us. Yep. Um, could an applicant apply this to you for a deferred place? That's yes. Possible. Yeah, that's the thing. So basically you go through the same, what you're doing is give, guarantee his place in the year in advance. So yeah, you go through exactly the same process uh, and that offer would then be made for a 2023 entry. 
Uh, you could then use that year. Historically in the past would have been a gap year for you to travel the world maybe, but obviously the pandemic has restricted that a little bit for people. But as we open up, hopefully that could be something. Some people would do it just to get finance behind themselves. Others will use it for more work experience or insight into pharmacy roles. So yes, we're happy for that. And in fact, a person we make an offer to for 2022, if they then decide closer to a level result day, in fact, even prior to enrollment, they could request and we can defer that uh, post uh, to the following year if we believe it's correct for that student. Um, does the Welsh back, um, you know, what difference does it make to how we interview or consider the applicant? Um, I mean, it's basically a third A level. Yeah, so, so, so we don't treat it any differently. It's considered as third A level. You know, originally when the Welsh back out, came out that most schools would do three year levels in the Welsh back on top, particularly the skill side of it was very useful uh, for those applicants. But in terms of uh, what we've seen is a movement where some students are only doing two A levels and the Welsh back. Um, you will note though, in some English universities, particularly schools of pharmacy, they will not accept the Welsh back as a third A level. So you have to have three strong A levels to get in and the Welsh back is on top. For us, the most important element of the Welsh back is actually the, the project that you do, particularly if it's healthcare related. Uh, it can be very useful to show an insight into your the way you work. And it's something to break up the interview. We may talk about it, particularly if it's a, a relevant topic that, of interest to us, as I say. But just be wary about how it's used. But in terms of it, it's an A-level. But in case of that offer, if a Welsh back is there, then obviously we, our standard offers two A's and a B. It could be if you have some weakness in the sciences and you'd have to have chemistry plus or biology as A level one, then one of the four for bio, A level two, we could say, right, our offer is going to be two A's in the sciences and then a B in the Welsh back. We don't often do that, but it could be something that might happen. But otherwise, the Welsh back is just seen as another A level from our point of view. Thank you. Um, quite a popular question um, about equivalencies, really. Um, yep. Can you get A star AC uh, yep. rather than AAB? And I know we're trying to tighten up a bit more on the exact grades this year, aren't we? Yeah, so so our position is we, we specify typically the grades. You have to meet them. Obviously, what we do is everyone who's mapped their target exactly, they will get in. Uh, if we have them places available, then we start to look and obviously a grade equivalent where you've indicated in that example that was just given your equivalent to what you should have required, then that person is more likely to get in and get a place if we have those available than someone who's missed by a full grade, for instance, and doesn't have the equivalency. So we're almost it's part. We use grade equivalencies as part of the ranking process. If we have spaces, we're not full. Obviously, this year where we had the CAGs, then we weren't, those great equivalencies wouldn't have got in because we were full up and over our numbers with the um, with it, the ones who'd hit the target, as it were. So they're not, so it's very across other schools of pharmacy, though you will need to speak and check with them how they treat that position. But for us, grades firstly, then we obviously, if we have places left available, then we'll start go through and grade equivalences are used at that point only. Thank you, Al. Um, a question here on the actual delivery of the teaching. Uh, how much has been online this year and how much on campus? Yep. So, yep. so it's difficult to give you the exact numbers uh, because it does vary every year. Uh, we are using face-to-face, -face, but what we're doing is not gone. We haven't gone back as much as we did prior. So we've actually changed our approach. We were already in the process of doing that prior to the pandemic. As I've indicated, the need to do more clinical skills training, the need to do more placements has meant we had to free space in the timetable. And what the pandemic has showed us, that realization that actually getting a student to sit in a lecture theater for five, six hours, sitting, listening to one after the other, members of staff talk about a particular subject isn't necessarily the best way of teaching. So a lot of that material that was traditionally given in lectures is now given as online activities, giving you material up in front, you go away and learn it, then we'll have either online or face-to-face -face activities based around that material where we show you the relevance of it. You can go through Q&A and actually in real life this is how you learn. 
no one teaches you how to learn a particular subject. You go off and find that material. So what we're doing is pointing you in the right direction. Obviously, what we're trying to get in, and we're, we're, we're going to adapt over the next year and a bit going forward, is obviously the amount of placements. We have to increase that level of placements to make sure you're ready for prescribing. So that's where we needed to free the space. So we're doing more face-to-face -face this year than last year when we were in full lockdown. We did have face-to-face -face activities last year, but they were limited. We've increased, but we're not going back to what we were before. But it's the nature of what we're going back to. We want the relevance in those face-to-face -face activities, whether laboratory classes, practical classes, workshops, seminars, or placements. That's where we're emphasizing where we need to put those, those activities. Thank you, Al. Um, this is a good one. This is a scenario for you here. Um, if you had to choose between two students to get a place, um, one had a strong personal statement but weak grades, and the other had a weak personal statement but strong grades, which would you pick? <laughs> <laughs> it's an almost impossible answer uh, type of thing. It, it really would depend on the situation. We're going to go back to the interview that just the pieces of paper alone are not going to be uh, you know, the outcome. You know, we're going to look back at then maybe the full profile of that student. How did they perform at GCSEs? The background, is there contextualized flags associated with them? So it's almost impossible to give that answer because it would have to be looked at an individual case on that particular day. And I'd say the only occasion that will arise is if we didn't have, you know, we were limited in the places available during the August period. You know, we've given out offers. We've only got one place available and you were the last two students. And then we take our time about that. In the either world, we, we take maybe both of those students, um, but it's difficult to say because I'm, I'm not in that particular position. But just to guarantee, we will look at every little bit of information we have before we make that final judgment. Thank you, Al. Um, is there any tests involved in the interview, admissions tests? Uh, not in, in Cardiff, we don't. We used to do. We used to do a little English language thing. We've done maths tests in the past, but we don't now. I've talked you through the process. So we're going to talk to you about academic questions. We're going to talk about you and your personal statement, about the role of the pharmacist, ethical dilemma, but there are no tests. Some school of pharmacy, though, do run tests. Some are done in advance of an interview. Some schools of pharmacy will do online interviews uh, where they're group activities. Some are doing MMIs, mini mock interviews. So it does vary. So check out what each university is doing. But in Cardiff, there are no tests associated with our interviews. Right. Um, one more about accommodation. Is there any halls of residence near to where the pharmacy building is here? Uh, for international uh, female students, then Aberdeer Hall, which is across the road from a building, is typically uh, the most commonly one used. Otherwise, majority of the students, certainly first year, all go into what we call Talabont. It's about 10 minutes up the road, 15 minutes, depending on the size of your legs in terms of walking. It's on the main road coming into Cardiff. It's where the student accommodation has most of the sports facilities. There's a big Tesco's Extra not far from it. McDonald's and a load of fast food places. So I live in the north of Cardiff. I drove down past North Road uh, where Talabont is and I see the students all walking in, but that's where majority of students will live. In the first year, that's where they're picking. After the first year, however, most of the students will move closer because they're moving to what we call Cotes or Studentville. So lots of old terraced housing in and around the Students' Union and the city centre campus. Um, and then majority of students there are living there. And again, they're within five, 10 minutes of the building, but also five, 10 minutes from the city centre itself. So you know, there's lots of accommodation in Cardiff. That's one thing we're not short of, and it ranges. So as a pharmacy student, guaranteed accommodation in the first year, if you go firm with us, so you make us your first choice. After that, then majority of students are moving out and they'll move into the local area environments. So there's plenty around, there's both private and uh, rental houses available. Thank you, Al. Um, did pharmacy go into clearing this year? So was there excess vacancies with us? Uh, not this year, as I indicated. This year was an unusual year uh, where we were well over, well over our target. We were looking to get rid of students, you know, finding almost reasons to lose them because we were well over our numbers 
Uh, so we were looking to recruit in this year 140 students and we at one stage we were in the, the 200s, we were panicking a bit. Uh, but we've ended up somewhere in the region of 180 students, we're over target, but we've accommodated and we've accommodated in our teaching. Um, in previous years, we have dabbled in clearing. Most often it's just uh, picking up one or two students of high quality to, to come in. We're not there normally looking for big numbers. So, you know, small number, four or five, maybe a handful of students. Or sometimes it's just looking to see if there are any international students to because we haven't fully recruited our international numbers. Thanks, Al. Okay. Um, and last question on here. Um, does Cardiff University have a rugby union team? Of course we do. Uh, okay, of course we do. So Cardiff University is part of what's called Bucks. So this is the British University. I can't remember what the S stands for, society or something like that, where all universities play against each other and they're ranked. So it's the Bucks leagues are the premier league of, uh, of inter, <laughs> inter sport, as it were. So Cardiff University uh, is a high powered. They have links with uh, Cardiff uh, rugby as they are now they used to be Cardiff Blues then I got it rugby so we have people in the academy we've had professional sports rugby players with us who've been part of the academy or with other uh, local clubs playing so yes the school of pharmacy itself has a society called whoopsa uh, the students will talk about that on the weekend they have netball teams but they also have a rugby team as well and a football team and they play other schools of pharmacy as well so there's plenty of opportunity to do sport we encourage you to do sport and if you've never played rugby there's also a social side to it they'll have social rugby available for you so something to look out with in freshers thanks al um, so we've got somebody asking, will we be, I think they mean, will we be represented at the Open Day Saturday? So yeah. just a little bit about the Redwood oh, Building. Being yeah, open. so the, Red, yeah, the Redwood Building is open. Let's say you, you, you need to have booked uh, for the event itself. So we're running mini tours. So we have four students who are going to basically bring, student, uh, bring uh, people through the building to a number of stations. Uh, myself and Lisa will be there. Uh, and Joe, you can probably see Joe's picture as well. We're all there on, on Saturday with a number of other academic staff to do some a little displays, as I, I'll call it, and to answer any questions that haven't been answered today yet. So, so if someone wants my signature, that thing, you know, I'll be there. I can talk to you. You can see me in a real life person rather than a video screen. We'll be there and hopefully you'll enjoy it. And we hopefully you'll see Cardiff in, in its good light. You know, that's one of the things. Uh, about Cardiff the students love is at the heart of the city we're not a camp a walled campus on the outskirts of the city you know 10 minutes and you're in the city center itself so the students love that they have an academic environment in which to study but also to socialize and life at university is a balancing act of the two together and we believe our students have that right uh, balancing act and we call it the family home that's what you'll find at the Redwood Building. We're the pharmacy family. You're going to come and join us in the pharmacy home on Saturday. So hopefully, for those who are coming, we we'll welcome you there. Thanks, Al. Uh, someone is asking what building we'll be in. It is the Redwood Building, but if you've registered online, um, there should be maps and things available when you arrive. And yep. I guess we're having um, student helpers uh, directing people around the Cotes Park camp. campus as well. Yeah. So. Yep. Let's ask anyone Redwood Building for pharmacy. Yep. Um, that is all on the Q and A. We have about three minutes left, two or three minutes. If anyone else wants to ask anything, no. Okay. Well, thank okay. you, Lisa, for joining me today. Thank you, Joe, for setting all this up, and thank you all of uh, those of you who've joined us today. I hope we've given you insight into to pharmacy as a career opportunity. And that's my first message. Think of pharmacy. Think of pharmacy as a, a real opportunity. Secondly, I hope then you'll think of Cardiff. And for those of you who come and join us, I wish you well uh, for that going forward. And uh, yeah, enjoy yourselves. And we'll hopefully see some of you in the near future. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.